So in honor of this being 4th of July and Hamilton being released uh, this weekend, um, I was going to do the sermon in like an epic rap battle, but then, you know, the Santa Barbara said we couldn't sing, so I had to throw, throw away my shot to do that. Um, that was the only Hamilton joke that's going to happen, and I, I couldn't throw away that shot uh, to make a Hamilton reference today. Um, if you didn't watch Hamilton this weekend, then, you know, it's still there waiting on you. Um, but, you know, what I want to start out with saying, though, is that um, introducing this new series that we're going to be starting today, my daughter Nina is uh, almost three years old, and she's in that phase that all parents know about. It's the phase where she asks questions all the time. Um, it may start with an innocent question like, um, what is that mask that you're wearing? And then um, the whys come in, and she just says, why, why, why? You keep answering, and she keeps saying, why? Um, and it can be maddening to parents, but I think it's amazing because uh, children are naturally curious. And as adults, we often lose our curiosity, and we push the questions aside. And I realized that today, you've likely got a lot of questions Questions about life, questions about the future, about suffering, about injustice, about God, about the Bible. And you may be tempted, you may be tempted to abandon those questions. Someone maybe even has told you um, to stop asking those questions and just believe. But I'm going to ask you to bring those questions to God and to his word and seek answers like a child asking her dad why. Explain it to me, Dad. Questions help us learn. In fact, many of the Protestant theological traditions use this system of question and answer to train people to see the themes and motifs of Scripture as a way of systematizing the books of the Bible into a coherent theology so that people would understand what the, what the Bible teaches. This method was called catechism or catechesis, which means to echo the teaching. And the next several weeks, we're going to ask some questions. We're going to use a modern version of catechesis called the New City Catechism to look at some of the most basic questions that every person, religious or secular, needs to answer in life. Questions like, what's the purpose of life? What happens after death? What's wrong with the world and how is it made right? What do I do with my regrets? These are important questions. It's no doubt that you have maybe questions that are more relevant and specific to your life today that you're bringing in here. You may be asking, why doesn't God deliver me from the besetting sins that I've been praying for for decades? Why did God make a world with the possibility of COVID-19? When will God deliver me from depression? What does God think about racism and injustice? And I wanna tell you, don't abandon those questions either. Come and talk to me or Kyle or any number of the wise men and women in our church. I don't know if I'm claiming to be wise in that statement, but there are lots of, there's lots of wisdom here in this place. So, so go and um, seek answers. Talk to someone about the questions that you have. But the questions we're going to look at in this sermon series, I believe, are hanging above and behind and underneath those questions that are extremely relevant to your lives. And so it's important for us to ask those questions and know what the Bible teaches and know how we answer them because everyone needs to answer those questions. And today we're asking this question. It's a big one. What is the purpose of life? And as we ask that question, let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you that you have spoken to us in your word and we pray that you speak to us today by your Holy Spirit that as I am speaking and we are all meditating together on your word, that your spirit would be at work in our hearts and in our lives, applying your word and building your kingdom among us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So what is the purpose of life? This is, like I said, one of the big ones. This is an important one. But you may think, oh, no, that's for college sophomores to think about. They're the ones that think and debate in the dorm rooms but at some point, you just have to stop worrying about the questions about the purpose of life and existence and go to work and leave those existential questions behind. But what if I told you 
that, um, that the way you answer this question affects every sphere and season of life. I want you to think about it for a minute. And don't give yourself the Sunday school answer. Some of you know these catechisms well. Um, but, but think about it in your own words and ask yourself, why do I live? Why do I go about the ins and outs of my life? Why do I go to work and raise children? Why do I engage in hobbies and politics? Why do I make friends and consume art? Why do I serve and give to the poor, the widow, and the fatherless? What is the purpose of human life? Now, there are lots of answers to this question. There are lots of ways that people attempt to answer this question. Some might say, especially in our day and age, in our culture, they might say that romantic love and fulfillment, um, relational fulfillment, is the purpose of life. That you aren't complete unless you find a partner who loves you the way you want to be loved, just the way you are. And there are a million bad songs and a few good ones that um, support this view, right? But what does that mean? If, if romantic love is really the purpose of life, then what does that mean for lifelong singles? What does that mean for children? What does that mean for those in unhappy marriages or for the divorced or for widows? The truth is, I don't know many people with relationships that look like the pop songs. And so we have to ask the question, can that really be the purpose of life? Well, others might say that you find your purpose through work, through a vocation that fulfills you. Do what you love, no matter what. But what about my friend Colleen, who lives in Peru, who studied physics, and then the only job that he could find was to drive a cab? Did he miss his purpose? What about those who are gifted in ways that the market doesn't value? What about the unemployed or the retired? And besides, anyone who follows this dream of doing what they love know that it will cost you dearly. Because when you do what you love, it can own you and take over your life and demand everything in service to it. Others might say that your purpose is to change the world, to live a radical life, whether it's through innovation or through activism. Help others make the world a better place, leave your mark. Build a company, start a nonprofit, advocate for the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized. And those are good causes. Those are great causes. But what about when you are the one who needs help? When you need someone to dress and bathe you and change your sheets, do you lose your purpose? Now, there are even religious answers to this question of purpose and the reason for life. Maybe you've heard it said that the only reason that you exist is to make other Christians. So you get other people to believe in Jesus, and then they get other people to believe in Jesus, and then they get other people to believe in Jesus, and so on and, and so forth. Or maybe you've heard it articulated in a way that, that your only purpose for life is to just sin less and become a better person through personal self-improvement and discipleship programs. Again, good things. But is it really the purpose of life? And there's still others among us who may prefer to just avoid this question altogether because we might even be afraid of what the answer is. There's no shortage of existentialist philosophers who will tell you that there is no purpose, that everything is meaningless, and the only purpose that exists is the one that you construct, whether that's helping the poor or exploiting him to get what you want. Because anything that demands your obedience takes away your liberty. To be truly free, the philosopher might tell us, we must rid ourselves of any sense of purpose and meaning and construct our own. Life, liberty, and the purpose Sorry, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness without any restraints. That's where our purpose is found. Well, what does the Bible say? Our text today is a few short verses from Genesis. If you miss them, I'm going to read them again because it's actually just one verse. Genesis chapter 1. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. He, male and female, he created them. Now, you may wonder, why go to Genesis to talk about purpose? And Kyle has already told us. Because to go to, to find the purpose of a thing, we have to go to the mind of the maker. To go to the purpose, um, we have to look at in, the intent 
And so um, we, to look at, to understand the function of a thing um, helps us understand the purpose. And it's true with human beings as well. And we see in, these, in this short verse, this liberating truth that God created humanity in his own image. Every single person, every color, every tribe, every language, every ability, every person is created in the image of God. And the Bible testifies in other places that this image cannot be taken away. Sin and the curse cannot obscure completely the image of God. So what does that have to do with purpose? Well, first it means that we don't live for ourselves. We don't have to find or create meaning or purpose ourselves. We look to God for that because he created us. And while he did give humans the command to cultivate and to care for the creation and to fill it with more image bearers, first and foremost, God wasn't looking for workers. So what was he looking for? He was looking for lovers. See, Genesis was written to a group of liberated slaves. And at the time, the prevailing narrative among the religious neighbors of their day the prevailing narrative about the creation of the world said that the gods created human beings as slaves, people to feed the gods grain and lambs through sacrifices. And it was a very common narrative about the, the creation of the world and the creation of human beings. And, um, and among Israel's neighbors, it can be assumed that they would have said that the purpose of life was to provide for the needs of the gods. And yet here in Genesis, God gives us the true story. The story of a God who didn't need slaves. In fact, he didn't need anything. Father, Son, Holy Spirit in perfect unity, perfect relationship, perfect community, perfect love. And yet he created a world and it was good. And he populated that world with human beings to reflect his image. And in fact, he, it's not only that he didn't need anything, he didn't need the human beings to feed him. He actually fed the human beings, if you read the story. He provided food for them to eat. And in in fact, in the beginning, he was their host. In the Bible, the, the God of the Bible actually was the host and the server to serve his people that he created in his image. That's because God created humans to love to be loved by God and to love him in return. Our catechism for today puts it like this. Here's the question. How and why did God create us? This is question four of the New City Catechism. And the answer that they give is this. God created us male and female in his own image to know him, love him, live with him, and glorify him. And it is right that we who were created by God should live to his glory. That's good news for us because that means that our purpose transcends anything that we do. That means that we have a purpose at the moment of conception. That means we have a purpose until our dying breath. That means that every person on this planet, every person you'll ever meet, you've ever met, is given value, dignity, and worth and is deserving of love simply because they are created in God's image. Our purpose, we exist as humans to be loved by God and to love him in return. We're not slaves or servants, but lovers. We're not tools in the hand of God, but guests around his table. And we have to understand that as we contemplate our purpose. Because our purpose is something that's intrinsic to us by being created in the image of God before we even lift a finger. Anything else we look to for purpose will own us, use us, and throw us away. Even our good works, even our service to the poor and advocacy for the outcast, even the best jobs and the best marriages. But God in Christ actually gives himself for us, for his creatures. He is so committed to his purpose for our lives that he took on flesh and suffered in order to redeem and reconcile us. Why? For love. For love. For God so loved the world that he sent his son. And if we find our purpose in him, then 
everything else actually changes. We're able to love our neighbors sacrificially. We're able to love our spouses and our children with grace and mercy. We're able to forgive. We're able to work unto the Lord and find satisfaction even in the most menial task and unsung jobs. We're able to seek justice and show mercy because we believe that each person in this world exists to be loved by God. But you know, we don't know our purpose just by looking at our beginning, at our creation. We also find it by looking at our end, our goal. The one who exhibited human flourishing. See, God is not just our creator, but he's also our redeemer. And the Apostle John, in a passage that evokes the first pages of Genesis, says this of Jesus in John chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything that was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, at the time that that John wrote that, there was a debate among philosophers. David Vanderlaan can tell you more about this as a professor of philosophy, as can Brian. Uh, But there was a debate, and the debate was around this word, logos, the reason for life. And John picks up that that word, that Greek word, logos. And it's translated in that chapter of John 1 as word. But if you see the meaning that's actually behind it, it's the reason for life, the first principle for life. See, John is saying, in the beginning was the reason for life. And the reason for life was with God, and the reason for life was God. Because Jesus is not just our creator, He's also our redeemer. He is the reason for life. He is our goal, the true picture of human flourishing. He is the blueprint that we all must follow to truly flourish. The only way to be truly free then, to be truly liberated, is to take up our cross and to follow him. To, like Jesus, pour ourselves out for our neighbors, fellow image bearers, wherever they may be found. Whether at the border or in the womb, in the jail cell, or in the face even of our enemies, political or otherwise. Even our neighbors in these socially distanced grids that we worship in, in this sanctuary today. He is not just our creator, but he is our blueprint and and our vision for human flourishing that we follow. Without him, we cannot find the reason for life because the reason for life came into this world to redeem us and restore us to God so that we might be loved by him, so that we might love him in return, and so that we might, in love, go out into this world to fulfill our purpose. Someday we will be made like Jesus, conformed to his image, as the New Testament tells us, glorified. May we find the reason for life. May we be loved by God loved by Christ, the reason for life, in a way that we all desperately want to be loved. And may we go out into the world to share that love with a world that desperately needs it. Lord, have mercy as we do that together.